Hello viewers, today I want to give you a little idea, a little insight, and a little video here of why ball joints are so expensive. Why is it so expensive when you take your car to a shop and they tell you that it needs ball joints? Can you expect close to a thousand dollar bill? Here's why. I'll go into as much detail as I can without making the video excessively long, but I want to just give you an idea of why ball joints cost so much and why it's expensive to get this job done. First off, and probably most obviously, is labor. Now this is a 2001 GMC Yukon with almost 300,000 miles on it, so it's expected to have a component like this worn out. Ball joints will last anywhere from about 60 to 100,000 miles if you've got the factory originals. Now I have seen some ball joints go a quarter million miles before they need to be replaced. However, they were maintained very well, lots of highway miles. If you do lots of city driving that, expect to get somewhere around 60,000 miles out of a set of ball joints. The upper ones on GM vehicles are usually the ones to fail first because they're smaller. However, on Ford vehicles, you might notice the lower ones fail more frequently. It all depends, but either way, regardless of what vehicle you have, this is a labor-intensive job. And there are many different ways to go about doing this, but what I've found in my experience, the easiest way to do ball joints and just get everything out of the way and have the most room to work possible is to remove the spindle from the vehicle here. And this is going to include your hub bearing, your brake rotor, the brake pads and the bracket. Certain vehicles, you can leave them on there. It's just that much less to take apart. Usually you take your wheel speed sensor out with it, unplug that. But this comes out of the way. Now, some vehicles, the ball joints will actually be pressed into the spindle. Other vehicles, such as this GMC Yukon, they're pressed into the control arms. So as you can see, this is a point I had to get to on a four-wheel drive GMC Yukon to replace both the upper and lower ball joints. Now let's talk about the second thing that makes ball joint jobs expensive, and that is the tools required to do this job. Here I have a snap-on ball joint press, and these kits, depending on what you get, can be over $1,000. It's ridiculous how expensive ball joint presses can be. And that's just the way it is. It's a very heavy-duty press. You can also use these to press U-joints out, but typically these are used for ball joints. I'll explain to you how this works later on in the video when I demonstrate the removal of the driver's side ball joints. And last but not least, the parts are just stupidly expensive as well. This is just a little joint here with a little boot around it. It's just a little bit of metal, a little bit of rubber, and the good ones have a grease fitting on them so you can grease them and lubricate them help them to last a long time but if you don't grease them they're not going to last any more than a cheap one will so always buy a ball joint that has a grease fitting on it and in my opinion buy the more expensive ones that are going to last longer simply due to the labor involved in replacing these little guys a good set of ball joints when purchased at a place that isn't going to royally rip you off is going to cost you about 40 to 60 bucks for the lower joint and another thirty to forty dollars for the upper joint and that's for good ball joints now you can get cheaper ones for eight to fifteen bucks a piece but they're not going to last long at all so obviously on every vehicle you're going to have to take the front wheel off to get to the ball joints behind it so let's take the front wheel off Now again, this is the point where a lot of people are going to do things differently, but what I like to do is leave the wheel speed sensor connected to the spindle, disconnect it from the harness on the vehicle. That way you don't worry about breaking the sensor when taking it out of the spindle, which can happen frequently on old vehicles. I also like to take the caliper off as well, so that way you don't have to worry about any brake fluid leaking out. Separate it from the caliper bracket. Now because this is a four-wheel drive model, we're going to have to take this little cap off to get to the axle shaft nut that holds the axle shaft to the spindle. 
Then using a giant 35 millimeter socket, and give the axle shaft a couple light taps with a hammer. Make sure you always put the nut on partially so that way you don't damage the thread on the axle shaft. And as you can see, now it's loose. The axle shaft will slide out when we get the spindle off. Now here comes the fun part where you get to take all your stress and frustration and anger out on the vehicle. And what I mean is you're going to use a uh, fairly good sized hammer to strike the spindle around the outer tie rod joint and the upper and lower ball joint. So what this will do is a shock from hitting these parts of the spindle will loosen up the bond that is developed over time between this outer tie rod end and the upper and lower ball joints. So, let's have some fun with a hammer. Now we're just about ready to separate the spindle from the control arms, but before we do that, we have to actually break the bond between these upper and lower ball joints and the spindle itself. Same thing that we did with the outer tie rod end here. You loosen it a little bit, strike it with a hammer several times, and after you've loosened up the bonds, the spindle will slide out. But you want to be careful because if you take these nuts all the way out, that spindle is going to fall out and could fall on your foot. I wear steel toes, but I never really want to count on them for this matter. And besides, it's going to put a nice big gash in my concrete floor if I let this suddenly hit the ground, not to mention it could damage the spindle, the pads, the rotors, whatever. So I always leave the ball joint nuts on loosely. And once the spindle comes loose, I hold the spindle, take the uh, ball joint nuts out the rest of the way, and then the spindle comes out. You'll see what I'm talking about here as I demonstrate on video. And there you go. Now, we're ready to take the ball joints out. Now, in order to remove the ball joint, the first thing you need to do is remove the little clip which holds it in place. Now, you'll need a C-clip tool to get this out. I'll show you how this uh, little clip comes out of here. It's pretty simple, actually. This is the tool you need to get the little clip out. Grab the little clip, squeeze the pliers, see how it spreads it apart. In this case, I need a little bit bigger pair of pliers. And there it is. Now we can press the ball joint out. Same thing with the lower one. Now this is a job where it can be configured in a lot of different ways. But one thing we know for sure, there's got to be room underneath the ball joint here to be pressed out. So as you can see, the stud sticks through. I'm going to use this little cup here as an adapter. And what this will do is this will grip the bottom part of the control arm but yet allow the ball joint to be pushed through the cup. As I press the ball joint out, you'll see what I'm talking about here. You'll see how this works. Now, a lot of times I'll just get my air impact and thread this ball joint pressed down. But for demonstration purposes, for those who have more hand tools, I'm going to use a wrench here just to give you an idea of what you can do. There you have it. The old ball joint is out of the vehicle. There it is. And now we'll do the same thing to the upper ball joint. Now this time I'm going to use my impact with a socket instead of a wrench to show you how much faster it is to press these out using an impact.
And there's the old ball joint. Now one other thing I wanted to point out. You notice how my ball joint tool actually went through the lower opening for the lower ball joint here on the lower control arm. That's quite common and a lot of times even if your upper ball joint is bad and your lower ball joint is okay, removal of the lower or upper ball joint may be required to get to either the upper or the lower. And that's why generally when ball joints are replaced, you do both of them at the same time because most of the time removal of one or the other is required to get to one or the other. Not all the time, but a lot of times that's common, especially on Ford vehicles where the ball joints are pressed into the spindles and you don't have flexible or removable control arms. All right, this video is starting to get a little long. I don't want to drag it on too long and uh, bore people with an excessively long video. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to split this into two parts. This will be the removal process. If you want to watch the installation procedure, I'm going to have that up shortly. I'll also post a link to it right over here somewhere, wherever we put the whatever they are, thumbnails for the next video, whatever YouTube calls them. YouTube's changing so much more these days anyway. I don't even, I can't even keep up. I mean, I logged into my account the other day and everything was changed. The layout was changed, the home screen was changed, my account was changed. Anyway, I'll figure it out and I'll have the video somewhere here for you guys if you want to watch the installation procedure. As always, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and I'll see you guys in the installation video.